All right. Thanks, Brock. So, thank you, everybody. I always know the, the first session after lunch is a tough one. Everybody's in a food coma. So I'll try to keep it somewhat lively. Um, as Brock mentioned, uh, an in-depth analysis of now 150 plus uh, production deployments. When we initially put the abstract for this talk, it was a few months ago. There's a you know, fair bit that have been added since then. As a quick inter uh, overview, so from Databricks, Databricks is the company that was founded by the creators of Spark uh, in 2013. It's the largest uh, contributor to Spark. I think at last count in 2014, something between 75 to 80 percent of the code, uh, you know, in Spark or contributed to Spark was written by Databricks, and it provides an end-to-end -end hosted platform in the cloud. Um, one of the interesting things also being at, at Databricks is, yeah, we have a pretty wide uh, view of all of the different Spark use cases that are going on. This is through a couple of sources. One, um, from early on, we've had partnerships with uh, you know, Cloudera and then Hortonworks and MapR and Datastacks where we get visibility into a lot of their uh, deployments of Spark because we provided L2 and L3 support. We have the Databricks cloud platform itself, which has an increasing number of users. And then in addition to that, there is, you know, just because, well, whenever you have Matei uh, and the creators of Spark at the company, you get a lot of different companies reaching out, asking for advice, talking about their deployments and so forth. So when we talk to new people who are interested in Spark, there's generally three questions uh, that they ask as they're interested in getting going. One is, for the people who did it, everybody's looking for analogies or peers. Why did they choose Spark? Uh, how did they actually uh, use Spark? And what were the main challenges? Right, so we can learn from that and go above it. And so we'll try to go through the three of these today and uh, cover, you know, I can't go in depth uh, into any of the single use cases. Obviously there's 30 minute talks that go into that, but more try to provide a flavor of some of the use cases and some of uh, you know, the high level answers to these questions. So our study set was about 150 uh, plus uh, production deployments and from a company size perspective, it included companies from less than you know, 10 people all the way up to companies in the Fortune 50. Right, I have, you know, oftentimes we focus just extensively at the right side of the scale, but we wanted to look at a spectrum. And in terms of the industries of the companies that we were looking at that it deployed, it was really uh, across the spectrum of you know, data and data heavy and data analytics heavy, such as advertising and marketing to more traditional, such as energy and utilities and across the spectrum. So let's start with the question of why did they choose Spark? Um, and I know we're at a more developer-oriented uh, conference, but one of the first things I wanted to uh, look was, what about from a business perspective? Because one of the things lear we learned was that the mechanism for people actually getting into production and so forth was having a business answer, a business value for the use case. So first thing that everybody always said was productivity and time to value improvements there, right? And so three use cases that we looked at. We had one, it was a Fortune 100 media company and so forth, and so they had data from across a bunch of different properties, who was watching it, who was viewing the website, sentiments, everything like that. And they were trying to get more and more insights in their customers for thinking about how do we market to them, how do we basically target them better, how do we get more information about what do we need to change internally. Um, and from their perspective, it was using Spark enabled them to, in a much faster way, bring together a lot of data sources and have a much faster speed of, uh, for their actual analysts to be able to get answers on the order of minutes uh, or at the max hours as opposed to days beforehand. Second one was a Fortune 100 technology company that had now begun deploying significantly in the cloud. And so from a cloud perspective, some of the main questions that they had was how do we tell what are the features that are being used? What about clickstream data that are coming? Where are people stopping? What are, what are the issues that they're hitting and errors and so forth? And how do we correlate across these different groups? And how do we do it in a fast enough way that's effective? And then finally, we had a consumer electronics company. So if you imagine everybody now has, you know, whether it's a Fitbit or a MyBasis watch or an Apple watch or something on their arms now, it was you know, a company in that realm and they were saying, as we gather the data, how do we actually start looking at it? Of, um, we want to look at trends. How often are people doing this in a zip code? How does this type of activity correlate uh, with another type of activity, et cetera? And they was like, how can we do it at scale? Previously, they could do it with things like R and Python in a single node, and then scaling it up to much larger spectrums took forever for them. The second category that people said, it wasn't about productivity and time to value, but about new product enablement. Right? There was an entirely new business line that they wanted to do. So a couple of them here. Um, so MyFitnessPal, for example, for those who are familiar, um, with it, 
gathers a ton of data of what users are eating, uh, what are they doing with it, and basically nutrition facts, and they want to recommend to them, have a recommender system, what are the other foods that you might like, what are recipes, what are activities, and so forth, and being able to use Spark allowed them to scale up uh, the ML algorithm across all of their data. OpenTable, right, all of us are um, familiar with OpenTable, wanted to take their data and say all of the different recommendations and reviews that are coming in, whether you're looking at ambiance in there, whether you're looking at whether they like the culture, whether they like the food, and be able to recommend other restaurants and insights from that. And then finally, so Pickwell is a smaller company, um, a healthcare analytics company that's able to take a lot of claims data, build predictive analytics markets, and when you come in, they ask questions about you and they can answer, based on this, this is the healthcare plan that you should select. Not necessarily the one with the lowest premium, but it could always be other ones that basically, based on your history, these are the ones that have lower deductibles than X, Y, and Z. So now you say, okay, these are two high level uh, business principles that we're saying we wanna look at, but how are they actually getting there? And so what we found was it actually depends a fair bit on previous Hadoop usage. So did you use Hadoop before or not? And so in our example, about 60% were previous uh, Hadoop users, 40% had never used Hadoop. And, with Hadoop. and the answers were fairly different. So the first one was the efficiency of an ETL and data pipeline. Right, so we'll start with you know, an ad tech company, Radius and so forth. They had been using, you know, as you can imagine, with, a, with an ad tech company, you bring in a lot of data from a lot of different sources and you're constantly doing large ETL jobs to clean it up so that then you can use it and join it with the customer's data that's coming in. This process took an extremely long time and it meant that one, you were delayed in the freshness of the data that you can put in and two, how often you could do it. So they looked at Spark for the speed up of that ETL pipeline. Second one was ease and speed of ad hoc exploration. So now that you have the data beyond ETL, what about if I want to actually do ad hoc exploration, look for insights and so forth? Um, Conviva, as an example, puts a lot of the media streams out there and they're constantly looking at what are the differences in bit rate, the differences in video sources, video quality, so that they can actually show it to customers and alter it on the fly. So they used it, uh, it for that perspective and they moved over from uh, Hadoop and Hive uh, workload and then finally, when you're starting to look at combining multiple types of analytics. So we had a large education company that was looking at this and said, well, I've been able to kind of do machine learning on its own, but now I want to do, uh, I have streaming data coming in. What if I want to do machine learning with streaming? What's the process to do that? And Spark was a natural fit as you started getting more and more uh, elements on top of it that they combined. In this case, it's, we're seeing a lot of customers uh, or shouldn't call them customers, but basically users and students uh, come to the site, we're trying to see what are they looking at, what are the pages uh, that they're looking at, what are the exercises that are hard, how do we adapt them and so forth and continue to iterate without a human loop. If they'd never used Hadoop before, the world, of the, it looked a little bit different. The most common one was basically production, ML and data science at scale. In general, when you're talking about some of the users who haven't used Hadoop before and they're oftentimes using Python or R, the first thing when you ask them isn't, do you want your basically system to be faster? They consider the single systems fast enough. The question is when I want to take it from my small systems and I want to scale this up to run it on the whole data set, how do I do that? How do I explore on the whole data set? And so this was, for example, another digital health company, and they were looking at what is the correlation of exercise with temperature, as an example. And so when you looked at this notion, they were like, well, we can do it for either just our employees or a single zip code, but how do we run this across um, the entire US, right? And so this was Spark allowed them to scale up there. The second one was analysis across multiple data sources. We started seeing this more and more for these users. They, you know, there was a financial services company that says I have a lot of my transactions data that's sitting actually in a MySQL database. Well, uh, and then at the same time, I'm getting a lot of reviews to the website that's sitting in Elasticsearch or free text search. How do I actually combine the two together? What's the easiest way to do it? And I don't want to continually be moving my data. Right, and then finally, it was also moving beyond SQL-based analyses. So we had, there was a very large gaming company, as we kind of all know and love, and they had a massive Vertica database, and it's great. It ran for high concurrency, a lot of their users could come and touch it, ask a lot of questions, but now they wanted to look into it and say, how do we do things like likelihood of churn analysis, or do any kind of machine learning and graph computation as we have more and more data points in there? Well, it becomes extremely hard to do that on these SQL-oriented databases, so as a result, they were looking at for engines that could do the SQL piece if they needed to, but also be able to do those advanced anal uh, analytics, right? 
So another thing that became clear is like we love uh, in the industry, if you look at it, everybody talks about benchmarks, either how big can your cluster be or how low can the latencies be, right? So we talk about it, I think Matei mentioned we have an 8,000 node cluster that publicly referenceable at uh, 10 cent. I think that there's ones that are privately referenceable that are larger, or a petabyte uh, job per day or petabyte throughput for streaming. And we talk about latency of how do we get to millisecond scale and so forth. The reality is for most uh, production scale systems right now, uh, and there's always ones at the edge, but for kind of like if you look at the mean uh, and median, those aren't the biggest concerns, right? So if we, let's take a look at from a speed perspective, real time is relative, right? And we asked people as we looked at the different, again, what is the business value that you put on it? And effectively this chart came out, which is if you look at the X axis, which runs from the latency at the lowest end milliseconds and runs up to days, and then says what is the business value score that you'd provide here? And the funny thing is that you know, when it's at days, it's hard. From an ETL perspective, many of them were looking at can we get ETL to be on the order of hours? Because then it's kind of closer to real time and it's at the closer that we can take the data and provide it to an analysts so they could do something with it. If you get faster, there's some business value, but that's important. From ad hoc analyses, it was if you crossed over from hours to minutes, you now got to the point that people were willing to. If you got a question from a manager or so forth, I have ad hoc analyses. If I say that it's going to take 30 minutes on it, that's okay. Somebody can go and do it. If you know that the analyses that you want to do oftentimes is iterative is going to take 10 hours for it, people start becoming a lot less interested and they start doing a lot less analyses there. And then when you start looking at interactive queries and BI workloads, you're talking about second workload or at the second or basically maybe at the lower end high hundreds uh, of milliseconds, and also at streaming. It's very common that we get in conversations and somebody says, well, can you do this at you know, 10 millisecond scale? The real answer, the, the, the answer that I would ask them is, how much are you willing to pay for it if it was at millisecond scale? Right? Because the, the answer that quickly comes back is, you get your insights at milliseconds, but what you're getting the business value out of it isn't insights, it's what you do with the insights. And very few organizations are built to actually take millisecond scale uh, insights and put them into production. And the ones that are typically have custom built systems. There was a retailer that we talked to and he was like, you know, it's great, I can see my you know, actual inventory analysis, the millisecond scale updates. And I was like, how often do you change your inventory? He's like, well, the trucks go out once a week. So why the heck do you care about it at the millisecond scale? It seems like interesting, you're just sitting and watching the dashboard. So that was one of the things uh, that came out. The second notion was, Big data doesn't always uh, equate to massive cluster needs, right? So there's a couple of things. I think one is that, especially when we look at it from oftentimes the Hadoop-centric view of the world, is that cluster size is often driven by the size of storage, less so the processing needs all the time, right? So because you've uh, conflated compute and storage, you will oftentimes say, well, I have five petabytes of storage. Well, how much analysis do you want to do? Well, not much, but I still need the five petabyte cluster to, to hold all that data. Right? And we had a large financial services firm that was exactly this. They had a lot of basically historical data in there, but the amount that they were actually doing on um, machine learning on would oftentimes be a much smaller subset. The second piece is that there's oftentimes significant performance inefficiencies in the code. Like, I would love to say that distributed systems are extremely easy, but there's still hard complexities in them. And so what would happen is people would naturally assume this was slow, so if I basically make my cluster 10x the size, it'll be great. We're looking at it on simple things of what are the types of file formats that you're actually doing, how efficient is the SQL that you're writing, has significant ways of actually making it more efficient and not needing as large of a cluster size. And then finally, it's this notion of separate clusters for use cases is becoming more of a norm from what we saw. And this is obviously a lot harder in an on-premise environment because you have to basically get your servers, you have to put it out, you get one environment, that's where your data sits and so forth, and so you build these massive clusters. But especially in the cloud as we look at it, it's much easier to have uh, clusters that are dedicated for individual use cases, especially as data is spread out. And uh, at the same time there, it's basically you don't deal with the resource contention. You can build, you tune it for the specific workload that you want and tear it down when you need. And for this case, we had a large gaming company. Again, they had a lot of data, but lots of different games. The analyses that we're doing were very different. One wanted streaming analytics. The other one wanted kind of likelihood of churn and machine learning. Very different uh, across them and so forth. And so they just spun up separate clusters for that. So now, how did they use Spark, right? So the one thing that came out is everybody loves to think about whenever it's a new technology, what is the cool, sexy thing that we're gonna do with it? It's gonna be this advanced machine learning and deep learning neural networks. The answer was that first, every use case leverages Spark for ETL. 
bar none, all of them, because at the end of the day, you can't do the rest of the analyses unless you've actually ETL'd the data and gotten in a prepared form. So what we really saw was that standard ETL of being a new Spark 4 was basically one, the most common one that was consistent across every single one of the use cases that we looked at. The next one was actually ad hoc, um, basically, analysis and exploration as they went through it. And some of those would then make, so not all of your analyses made it to production, but when you found a model that you liked, you would go ahead and put in production. Behind that, the, one, the two that were the most common were you know, BI or data warehousing, as users put more data there and were connecting, you know, whether it was Tableau or Zoom data, et cetera, to it, um, and also starting to do streaming ETL. And then finally, uh, one that was kind of coming on quickly, but still not, would be lying if I said it was very prevalently used across it, was more of an online learning, right? So whether you're doing streaming k-means uh, on your data and so forth. It's an exciting area. There's a lot of people talking about the use case, but when you just look at the bare facts of what they were using it for, this was kind of the representation across the deployments. The next question was, we've had all of these fights of whether you know, Scala is great or is it Python or so forth. Nearly 100% of the deployments used at least SQL. And this is, you know, initially it was extremely counterintuitive. Everybody's like, well, we have hardcore Scala developers, we have Python. There was a couple of things that happened. One, many organizations, when you start looking at this production scale, actually have data analysts that, at the end of the day, they're most comfortable with SQL. There's other ones, they're data science engineer, but at least they have some data analysts that are comfortable with SQL. Second, it's used fairly often for ETL pipelines, and a lot of this was a lot of people were doing ETL using Hive beforehand, and it was a natural port over to using, basically, uh, Spark uh, with Spark SQL and using custom UDFs. And then one of the final ones is that basically schema RDDs kick-started this usage and we saw data frames has just accelerated it because now you have this world beforehand, it's all data is unstructured, it never has a schema. You start seeing that the data frames have become a fairly common representation across all the libraries, whether it's you're using Spark SQL, uh, whether you're actually using, you know, looking at GraphX, machine learning, et cetera, and so forth. And so it becomes, even when you're doing machine learning, learning as an example, it was very common for users to quickly do the exploration of how do I get the data quickly visualize it using SQL, right? The final thing that we saw was that data was actually becoming more and more distributed, right? And this is, again, we, we hear people naturally say, well, all of the data is going to sit in a single data lake. So more than a third of the use cases that we looked at used multiple data sources. Um, again, so there was another financial services company that did have basically Hadoop and data on HDFS, but they also had a significant amount of payments data that was sitting in HANA. And so that data wasn't gonna move. It wasn't gonna come out. There was no point in ETLing it on a regular basis at that volume over. And there's other ones that now are leveraging Cassandra or Elasticsearch a fair bit. We, you know, these came up in a lot of the deployments um, as well. And the reason is that joining of the data has value, but oftentimes it's not as if you need to join across the volumes of all of them, right? And especially with Spark, as it allows you to basically push down predicates and do filter pruning, it allows you to keep the data in the distributed places, um, but be able to join the answers. And the one other thing was more than 60% of the use cases actually used a non-HDFS data source. They could have also used HDFS, but at least some of them used a non-HDFS data source. So we had a software company that, again, clickstream data, it's in the cloud, uh, it was natural. A lot of their clickstream data is just naturally being dropped on S3, right? We don't know what we're gonna do with the data there. It has encryption, it's the cheapest amount of storage that we can get until we figure what, what processing we're gonna do and then we're gonna pull it into Spark and so forth. So there's a couple of takeaways that we took from this was one, in many cases, the data unification for these different use cases is actually taking place at the processing layer. It's not ETLing everything and sitting it on a single, basically, HDFS or single data source, but it's coming to the processing layer, figures out what you want to do and joining it there. And second was, as such, we're seeing compute and storage become decoupled in some places. Again, as I mentioned latency, we oftentimes fixate on this of, are you getting data locality? Is it sitting in the same place? And as the data becomes more and more distributed, that's gonna naturally become difficult. And so what happens is that you actually have uh, the distributed notion there. And you take the data that you need and join in a single place. And now, whether it's in Spark and memory, you have the locality you need for the iterative processing that you do upon it. So finally, what were some of the challenges? You know, you don't want to gloss over the, the easy parts. So the first one is that Spark is easier than the alternatives, but it still doesn't mean it's easy, right? I mean, it, you come out from a lot of the talks, people say, well, we now have the expressive APIs, everything's there. You can get, no offense to the head of marketing, but you can get the head of marketing to sit there, write a Spark job, and they're going to get all the analyses, right? So we're not exactly there yet. Um, so there's a couple of things. Um, 
configuration and tuning are still diff difficult, right? You still see, if you look at Spark mailings, people asking, well, what does cryo serialization mean? When do I actually use it? How do I set up the number of basically executors and partitions of my data source and so forth? Um, there's oftentimes lots of room still for performance optimizations that we need, but if you don't have Spark expertise, uh, you know, it, it, it was a common use case for us that we have um, Sean Ray, uh, who's basically like kind of one of the machine learning gurus in the lead of ML Lib, and somebody would look at it and be like, this is running in 10 hours. Can you look at it? And Sean Ray would be like, yeah, if you just change this and this, it'll run in about uh, 20 minutes. And he's like, it's obvious. I was like, well, to you it's obvious, but what about to everybody else who's trying to optimize the performance? And then finally, debugging distributed systems is still hard when you start seeing issues. How do you get through? So one of the good news, uh, though, in here is that Spark has made significant strides here and continues to do so. This is one of the major focus areas of the open source project. Second one was the natural question that people asked, oddly enough, whenever they were starting Spark was, what's the size of my cluster? Not anything else. It was rarely about the use case or everything else, is, but what should the size of my cluster be? So an example. Here's a Fortune 100 manufacturer company who's deploying, and they said, well, we have terabytes of existing data in AWS um, S3. Significant growth is actually expected. Uh, our initial use is by seven to 10 data scientists. It's growing to 50 or more data scientists within 12 months, and our workload is, well, we want to explore the data. We're doing machine learning on it, and then we're using streaming analytics to assign predictions regularly uh, and go live. So what should our cluster size be? And as we were working through this, and I kid you not, it's complex enough that I think at Berkeley there is a you know, PhD paper being written on how do you size uh, Spark and big data clusters, but a couple of high level thoughts uh, that we saw. One was that Spark doesn't require data to be cached in memory. This was the most common misconception that the people went to production. They said, well, I have 50 terabytes of data, so I need 50 terabytes of memory, right? That's the, it was the natural question that got asked. And, uh, I don't know how many times we had to explain that actually Spark can optimize for data in memory, but it doesn't require it in memory. So actually data size is always not the best predictor for what your cluster size is going to be, especially if you're decoupling storage uh, from processing. Second, as it, you know, I know I sound like a broken record, but lots of your inefficiencies in the code, that has a bigger impact. Focus on that, you can bring your cluster size down. Performance and cluster size oftentimes scale literally. So it's what's important to you. How much is it worth to you to basically have your uh, queries return in basically 10 seconds instead of 20 seconds, right? Because you could actually scale up the cluster to get that, or in terms of number of users. And the key thing that we said was, and you know, frankly, in a lot of these cases where there were cloud deployments, it made sense. It's you shouldn't have to worry about it. Pick different cluster sizes for different use cases, and you should be able to dynamically scale them up and down. Our most successful ones were, for example, we had a online media company that took a cluster size, started at 300 uh, gigabytes, and scaled it up to 1.5 terabytes to see what was the improvement in actually the algorithm running time, and then settled on the trade-off. That's harder to do on-premise, so it's basically in one, some of those cases it's figuring out how do you set it up, but the cloud has made it easy as more and more people explore big data to have that flexibility to figure out what their cluster size is. Another issue that people raised fairly often in our uh, different use cases was that a lot of dependencies and collaboration is hard. So you have IT, you have data engineers and data scientists and data analysts. Now, I won't get into the semantics of what is a data engineer versus a data scientist, but for you know, the moment, assume that they're kind of separate, discrete categories. So a couple of issues that people kept bringing up. One was that IT is oftentimes the bottleneck, right? They, they have to provision the servers, and every time you want new, because analytics capacity was increasing, how are we going to add more servers? Oftentimes they over-provision to not have to come back for new procurement cycles um, and so forth. And then oftentimes they don't know the context that I've already had about 10 people come up to me, super excited at this one, Spark 1.4, we can't wait to use Spark R. Why can't you wait? It's out today. Well, we have to wait till it kind of gets provisioned on the servers and then IT rolls it out and so forth and we can use it. So those were the delays that they saw. Data scientists often ask for what about tools that can help us collaborate better? And you've seen, you know, kind of I think across multiple vendors talk about notebooks as a kind of collaboration environment that people are enjoying and how does that basically improve that more and more? And then finally, the data analysts, right, who are not necessarily the programmatic guys, often say that it's a manual, slower, brittle process for getting the data from data engineering over to them so that they can actually use it and explore it, especially for adding more and more data sources pretty fast. How is it that we're going to you know, continue to do this and stay up to date? And so the theme that kept coming up, and I'm generally not one uh, to be a fan of buzzwords, but 
was the concept we heard from a couple of people, data democratization. That was the trend of how do we get to more self-service and data democratization. Now, I feel like there's a bunch of that that's hype, but at, at some point, these use cases and these issues that they were having, that was effectively what they were asking for. And the final point um, that I'll raise in here was about enterprise security, right? So there's no question, especially as you move to larger and larger enterprises, that the enterprise security model uh, and, and things like governance, things like audit, are extremely important um, as you go out in production. Um, the question is that how would you solve this case? So another large technology company, significant amount of data spread across S3 and Redshift. They have 500 projected users um, with a variety of uh, permissions that they need, even down to column level permissions. And they have use cases that they're using it for. Right now it's basically uh, graph computation, it's machine learning, uh, basically, and just doing general exploration. And they're leveraging just Spark at the moment. So how do you actually secure this, right? Because if you look at most of the conversations that have you know, happened from some of, the, some of the platform vendors, it's that they use storage level security, security in HDFS, security in Cassandra, so forth. But what happens when you're using Spark as your processing layer, multiple data sources? How are you harmonizing these different actual security mechanisms to what you need in, in your environment? What is, how do you integrate it with your actual existing security needs? And then finally, what a lot of them are basically asking for is, wouldn't it be natural to tie security at things like the data frame layer, at the processing or the application layer? Because you tell me from a Spark perspective that I shouldn't actually have to care about whether the data is in Elasticsearch or HDFS or basically Cassandra, so why can't my security model and governance that I provide in the data also be agnostic to that and so forth? Right? So, I just want to kind of uh, you know, do a quick uh, key takeaways from today. So from our point of what we've seen and talked about today, Spark is definitely being used in production. There's no, there's no doubt about that from what we see across a broad range of verticals and company sizes. Um, data, whether it's importing it, transforming, exploring it, and you know, making it readily accessible, as cliche as that sounds, is at the core of Spark adoption. Everything else of what you want to do, build on top of it, machine learning, advanced elements of streaming are kind of flavors that you add to that, but this comes at the core. And then the one final thing is that obviously Spark is you know, complementary to Hadoop and works with Hadoop, but some of the traditional deployments that people have used for their Hadoop deployments, you know, how do you size the cluster, how do you secure it, may not always be the most applicable for Spark. So with that, just wanted to thank everybody uh, for joining here. And for those who are interested, I think uh, Jan mentioned it, you know, made me promise to do a plug. So if you're interested, Databricks is obviously our cloud-based environment for Spark. Uh, please sign up uh, for a free trial if you're interested and take it for a test drive. Thank you. We have time for questions. Before the storm leaves. Yeah, before the. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Sure. Do you see customers using it for things besides analytics, Spark? So in terms, I mean, analytics is such a broad thing. What do you have in mind? Something completely different, like batch processing or something like that. Just large scale computation. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I c so I think when at the at the question when we said ETL is at the core, ETL is really just large scale batch processing, right? So it's absolutely if you don't do that piece and get it ready, you can't do the analytics. So we see everything starts there. Now, if the question is, are people more broader than analytics? Uh, you know. Are they doing basically like acid transactions on Spark? No, we haven't. Th that's not an area that we see that, that common and so forth. Oh, a real quick question. Uh, sure. You've got a pretty good data set there. Uh, do you know what proportion of these deployments were on-prem versus in the cloud? Somebody's you know, yeah. public cloud? So I think it was roughly about from the ones that we looked at, uh, I think about maybe 25% were on-prem and about 75% were cloud-based uh, of this one. Part of it is the, of the sample that we looked at, and part of it is for a lot of them, big data tends to be kind of a new deployment options. More and more have been moving to the cloud, but that was the sample size that we got. Yeah, hi, I'm just curious, uh, if you had a use case or a deployment that failed and, and what you learned from that, like a, maybe a bigger case? Yeah, um, I think that the first answer that I would say is that they didn't have a business use case for it. Um, the number of times that we saw people, that there's this natural notion of, well, I have a bunch of data, they tell me it's value, Spark is this whiz bang engine, and I'm gonna apply it to it, and I'm gonna get a bunch of value out of it. Immediately, some machine learning algorithm is gonna spit it out. So that obviously didn't happen in those cases. I think that the second areas that we saw were failed was some people, and it was why I put up the slide, 
bought into, especially where you had people farther away from programmatic. They were more comfortable with the visual environment, thought Spark was easy enough that you'd have some data analysts who didn't really understand as much data science or SQL were going to start using it. And they found it very hard to basically start doing the an analysis, especially machine learning. And so for them, they started looking at what is another layer that we can put on top of, like, say, an Altrix or a SAS on top of Spark and use it. But those are two of the very common themes that we would see and ones that failed. Hi. Uh, do you have any customers who are using it for large-scale real-time analytics using Spark SQL, for example? So, well, uh, what are you defining as large-scale and what are you defining as real-time? So, large-scale means terabyte plus data. And by real-time, I mean they want response time to be, let's say, less, less than two, three seconds. And it's ad hoc analysis. So, just like yeah. uh, from a BI tool, right? The user can run any kind of analysis. Yeah. But he doesn't want to wait for five seconds or 10 seconds. He wants less than five second response. No, I think that's absolutely true. So, from a large scale to uh, more than terabyte scale, absolutely. There, there's a lot of them that are doing it at this scale, right? Um, and uh, from the interactive sp space, yes. Abs uh, again, absolutely. In the span of, I think if you look at it, there was a study that says that when you're doing BI or interactive, if the response time is more than three seconds, you're context switching, people are losing interest and they're moving away, right? So now the question is, are they taking you know, 10 petabytes of data and getting a one second response time? There's obviously many less of those, but we did see, especially when people were optimizing it using such as you know, parquet files, partitioning it correctly and so forth, absolutely doing interactive queries on it and so forth. One of the areas that, you know, um, for those who didn't catch it, kind of uh, Samir, one of my colleagues talks, is on approximate querying, where you want to get, again, very fast response times, again, but on petabyte scale data, and you're okay with error bars. But yes, that's absolutely a very common one. That's more of in the BI data warehousing space where they're doing it. That's all the questions we can take. You can grab Arsalan offline. So thank you very much again, Arsalan. That was a Thank great you talk. guys. Appreciate it.